First of all, thank you for coming for the last session of the day. My name is Amit Kalamkar. I lead observability and analytics at Intuit. I have with me Vijit Morris. He is a principal engineer in my group. And today, we wanted to talk about how we are using Gen AI and AI ops to reduce MTTR at Intuit. So here's the agenda for today. We will talk about Intuit. Our operational excellence goal, how are we achieving those? We have a nice demo for you. And then we'll talk about Numa Proj, which is powering all of this and how you can use Numa Proj in different use cases. Most of you will know Intuit from our flagship product, QuickBooks, TurboTax, Credit Karma, MailChimp. We are also creators of Argo. So all these flagship products are powered by these five platform areas. These platform areas ensure that we drive customer value as well as drive innovation. Intuit is a 100% SaaS company. And from the numbers on the screen, you can see we operate at a pretty large, wall, uh, large scale. Intuit is also pretty much committed to open source. We not only use it for our applications and platform, but we have active committers as well as contributors in a lot of open source projects. The biggest success story for us is Argo. As most of you might know, Intuit created Argo, and now it's used worldwide, and it's one of the fastest growing projects in CNCF. Our latest open source project is called Numa Proj. It is used for stream processing, AI ops, and analytics. We just released 1.0 this week, and we are getting good community engagement for that project also. We are also proud uh, recipient of CNCF End User Award twice. So we, uh, we are thankful for that. So let me start with the Intuit de development platform journey. Like most companies, we started with moving to cloud. It was mostly lift and shift. The workloads were traditionally monoliths running on EC2. We started at a modernization of this platform back in 2018 when we started adopting cloud native uh, technology, containerizing it using Kubernetes. Uh, that helped us increase our development, developer productivity 6x. And now we are more focused on making a next generation platform which is more of AI based. So this is how our AI next generation platform looks like. We call it modern SaaS Air. It has four pillars. The first pillar is AI powered app experience. Here, we are using Gen AI to provide UX experiences to our customers. That includes assisted experiences, different types of experiences. The second pillar is Gen AI assisted development. That includes helping our developers with coding, debugging, testing. We are using things like GitHub Copilot here. The third pillar is AI-powered app-centric runtime and traffic management. Here we are using the data which we collect and AI to make the platform simpler for our developers so that they can concentrate on just writing their business logic. And last but not the least, is the smart operations using AI ops. All of this is possible because of our investment we have done in our operational data platform as well as Numa Proj. So let me tell you how high level how our operational data platform works. On left hand side you can see we collect a lot of data, data from Git, data from observability, data from Kubernetes in real time. And then use Numa Proj capabilities to ensure that this data is clean attributable, and then we store it in different stores, depending on the use case. For example, for real time, we use Druid. For long term, we use S3, and so on. Then we use, again, Numa Proj capabilities to analyze this data in, in real time. We use traditional statistic model, traditional AI models, LLM models, to drive actionable insights. And these insights are then used by different use cases. You can see it on the right-hand side of the slide. That includes security use cases, cost use cases, development productivity use cases, and of course, operational excellence, which is our highest uh, 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 usable use case. So let me talk about operational excellence at Intuit. Being one of the largest SaaS company, operational excellence is always a priority. 
We want to make sure our experiences and products are available, and we give a delightful experience to our customer. So these are the four pillars around which we are working on operational excellence at Intuit. First is reduce MTTD. We want to make sure that if there is an issue, we want to know about it. So we have done investment here on things like automatic golden signals, both for platforms and services. Also, we did something we called it as failed customer interaction, which is more how our customer feels about our product. I'll give you an example. If you are trying to upload a W2 in a TurboTax and it fails, we want to know about it. So we have used open telemetry to instrument that. And all of this has helped us reduce our mean time to detect for less than five minutes. The second pillar is reducing MTTR. If there is an issue, we want to fix it as soon as possible. So there are two pillars, two things which we have done here. One is the resiliency pattern, but we also use our automatic golden signal to fail over if there are any issues. And second is automatic rollback using progressive delivery. We'll talk a little bit more today on this. There are two more pillars for operational excellence. One is performance. We use Google Vitals, and we want to make sure that our, uh, we give a delightful experience for our users. And the fourth pillar is cost. We want to make sure the cost is manageable. All of this is powered by Numa Praj. Now let's talk about reducing MTTR in specific and how we are using progressive delivery for that. So before we get into the solution, let me tell you some of the data points. One third of our incidents are caused at Intuit uh, by change. And I think a lot of you might uh, 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 correlate with that. Second, we saw that our MTTR is high because although we have all the data, we have events, we have logs, we have traces, people spend time finding out the exact thing that can help them with their triaging. So we wanted to address that as well as we wanted to ensure that we give quick summarization for and triaging capability for incidents. So what we did was we integrated both AI ops and Gen AI into Argo CD and rollouts. We built two net new capabilities. One is AI ops, where we are collecting the data within the cluster, analyzing them, running an anomaly detection model, and making a decision whether we want to roll back automatically depending on how the change is. And the second, what we call this as Numa Assist. Here we again, we run an LLM within the cluster itself. We ingest logs, traces, events, all kinds of data, and summarize it for our developers so they know why a certain thing is happening. So now let me hand it over to Vijit to show it in a demo. Thank you, Amit. So let me first start with a small demo plan. And so what, I, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna roll out, um, roll out a change that has a bug inside and you will see how we roll it back and also how we explain the reason for rollback. So developers can know what is the reason for the rollback by, by summarizing log events and metrics. And based on the lessons learned, I'm gonna play a video on how to do it. So the way you have to see it is that on my right hand side, this is the uh, demo app we have and the yellow fishes represent success. Once in a file, you will see a red fish that represents error. So the fishes are going, well, I'm, we are gonna make a dummy change, this is, sorry, a buggy change and we use GitOps for any change at Intuit. We will merge this PR in and once we synchronize the changes in Argo CD, you will see that the new uh, canary deployment will, has been deployed. So we have the stable and the canary at the same time. Once the canary starts taking traffic, you will see that there are more errors, right? You will see more red fishes coming in. This means that there is a, a bug in the deployment and the analysis has started. So you'll see that the analysis run is starting. And the analysis template here shows anomaly scores. In case if you cannot see in the back, it's basically numbers saying that the anomaly score is around nine. I'll, get, I'll explain that in a second, but analysis clearly says that there's a problem. And we wait for around five minutes for a rollback to, sorry, five analysis runs before a rollback be triggered. And so um, the, um, only three of them have run and it takes around 15 seconds for one of them to run. 
So one key thing that is, uh, as Amit was talking earlier, that we developers has to see the metrics of the deployment, and uh, that's the metrics extension we added to Argo CD. So what we show here is the golden signal. It could be any metric you want to see it. These metrics are fetched from Prometheus, so you can add whatever golden signal you think is relevant. At Intuit, we do error rate, latency, and few, few, few others. So you can know that we have those metrics coming in. We also have to quantify in a generalized fashion saying whether your deployment is good. So what you see here is there is a blue line or a zero line, which is the anomaly score of your stable application that is running. And there, you, you might see a small change here, an orange line that is coming in. That is the canary anomaly score that is coming in. Okay, so if you see the values here, it's, the blue line is zero, meaning your stable is quite well, and the canary is showing a value of seven. Now let me explain what that means. Um, so we have the anomaly score at Intuit is normalized between zero to 10. Anything less than three means your application or your canary is operating within the normal operating pattern with respect to your stable. Anything more than three, meaning it is started deviating from the normal operating pattern, and the highest value it can reach is 10, meaning it is totally deviant from the normal operating pattern. That means anything less than three, we are good. Anything more than three, we auto roll back. So that's what we see. We have a seven, and if you come down here, you will see that the analysis template has finished running. That's the reason now, on, if you see the demo app, you don't see any red anymore. It's all blue, oh, sorry, all, all uh, yellow. Right, and if, uh, also we see all stable hash, the old good pods running. The canary has been removed because the analysis template finished. Now one question developers ask at this point is, why did it get rolled back? This is where the summarization comes in. This is powered by Numa approach. So this is a new tab, the Numa approach assist tab, where we show the anomaly score and some key metrics. So we can see that, okay, the, the error rate is going up. The anomaly score is around 9.28. That is the error rate. And it gives you the summary. Now, it's giving you two summaries. The first one is based on OpenAI, DaVinci model, 3.5 turbo. What it shows is that, first is the summary of the number of data set that came in, right? It says that there are 60 error error logs that's coming in, and also gives you a potential root cause. It says that, hey, the errors must be caused by too many Redis connections opened. So as a developer, they clearly know what's happening. Anyway, they are not that worried because we auto already rolled back the change. So this is a very good summary about what's happening and the potential root cause. Now on the bottom, this is OpenAI uh, DaVinci model, right? On the bottom, we also have our own fine-tuned custom model. This is way cheaper. It's an in-cluster, um, um, deployment of our LLM, that way it is way cheaper, fine-tuned on Intuit data. And the result is very promising and very close to the OpenAI one. The reason we do this is at scale, we had to run lot many analysis and we wanted to have a cheap way of doing it. And very close and very accurate result because we fine-tune on Intuit data. Given this, that you can use this LLM, this GenAI integration, not only at just deployment rollbacks. You can do it at any time of the day. For example, let's say you get a page during your day and you, they ask there's a problem and you want to debug, right? So let me just show you, right? This is, this is the running Argo CD deployment and if you want to click here, right, this, there is no deployment going on. This is the normal day-to-day -day operation. Right before the meeting, uh, the talk, I just triggered an OEM. You can trigger an OEM by just clicking here. So this is the demo app, and if I click here, right, it will take you to the place and it will tell you what's happening. So you can see the Numa project, let me zoom a bit here. The Numa project LLM saying that, hey, there is around this many errors and it, the container was terminated due to an OEM error. I hope that was too much of zooming, but see, so we use it at runtime too, meaning you don't have to just have to roll back to really see it. Anytime you see an error, you can come here and you can look at the, Numa Project Assist, which will tell you the summary based on all the data we come, that we gather and collect. Now let me get back to my slides and talk about how we do it. Okay, so. So the very high level architecture, right? So we have the application deployment here. First is the AF platform that uh, at runtime gets all the metrics and writes an anomaly score back to Prometheus, which is Argo's rollouts looking to, and making a decision whether to roll back whether based on whether the score is greater than three or less than three. 
The bottom part of the screen, what we do is the LLM piece where it, it has a data ingester that gathers logs, metrics, events. It does some pre-processing. And then it does a call to our LLM, right? This is the custom LLM and the open AI LLM. And we write the data back to the store, which is shown in the UI, the Argo CD NUMA project system. We also have a training pipeline which gathers this data and fine tunes based on um, a few intervals and how the um, organic uh, patterns are changing based on the traffic. Now, let's take a pause here because what you've seen here, right, is a very advanced platform at Intuit we use. Uh, we use the cutting edge technologies and we have, for example, we have a very scalable operational data platform. We use AI ops to make decisions. We use Argo rollouts for progressive delivery and even LLM being integrated. So the natural question that comes is, did you guys really have to boil the ocean to get to place where we are, right? And the answer would be no, we didn't have to, right? And then what, what is that we did, right? The key thing we did was from the very beginning, we made sure that we are able to stream data in and able to do stream processing in a very, um, very large scale manner. The key thing that when, when somebody talks about stream, stream processing or uh, real time processing they, uh, is mostly related to first thing that comes to mind is data engineers working on Flink or Spark on Java code base. And that meaning that there's a perception that it's only for data engineers streaming is accessible. And we wanted to change that. We wanted to make sure streaming is for everyone. Application developers, ML engineers, DevOps, SREs, product managers even. So the key thing is we have to make streaming easy for everyone, right? You, you should be able to use streaming in five minutes, learn it, and continue. So the rest part of the talk is how do we do that at Intuit at scale? And that's where we, the open source new approach come into play. And the rest of the talk I'll walk you through how do we do streaming at Intuit and how, is, how it is easy to do streaming for everyone. So what does Numa project include, right? So Numa project is a collection of Kubernetes native, open source, language agnostic, real time data analytics tools. It has three main components. First is NumaFlow, that is massively parallel real time data processing platform. This is the, where the data movement happens. Numa logic is a collection of ML models that we have been using for a couple of years and for uh, real-time operational data. And lastly, it's about control plane on how do you manage these resources. For this talk, we'll just stick on to NumaFlow because it itself is a big topic. So again, what is NumaFlow, right? It's a massively parallel data processing engine. This is where the data movement happens, right? And it's built with three core philosophies. First is it's very native to Kubernetes. That means that if you have a specification, it should be able to run on edge, on-prem, on the cloud with the same specification. You don't have to change anything. Second is the most important one. That is, it should be very easy to use, meaning you can write it in any language you like. It should be it's very easy to adopt. And lastly, scale and cost efficient. It can auto-scale all the way to zero and zero to many. And at our deployment at Intuit, we found out that it is 30% more cheaper than the Java equivalent versions like Flink or Spark. We are also creators of Argo, as you know, and the community has been asking from Argo workflow standpoint that, hey, if Argo workflow is for batch, what is the stream equivalent of it? And that's the Numa flow. It's one way to see Numa flow is, is the streaming equivalent of Argo workflows. And we fixed few things Argo had problems with. For example, there's a lot of port churn in Argo. Any event, you create a port, you churn out a lot of ports, you fragment your etcd. These are big problems at scale because company like Intuit, we have lots of workflow running, right? So we wanted to make sure those problems also get fixed in NumaFlow, hence we don't have those kind of etcd fragmentation or mutating the state or anything like that. Now, I have been talking about a pipeline. What really is a pipeline? Pipeline is, you can think about, you are reading from somewhere, that is the source you read from. You do something to it, some kind of transformation, some user-defined function, it could be anything. Then you write it out somewhere. There is a destination for this message, right? This is the simplest new pipeline you can imagine. You are reading, doing something, writing it out. Now let me walk you through one use case, one example as a demo. And for that, let me 
so pneuma flow comes with a lot of inbuilts, okay? They're Kafka, HTTP. So let's talk about a use case where you are reading from HTTP and you are writing to a log, you are just writing it out. And we will use a hugging face model to do something called a sentiment analytics. Sentiment analytics meaning I send in some sentence and it will send, say whether it's a positive or a negative sentiment. So I, I will demo this. Before I demo this, the first question is how easy it is to write a UDF. So if you see here, this is all you have to do. Meaning you have a handler, this is a Python code, it could be any code. You are given an input and you have to return an output. If you look at this code, it does not say there is any streaming aspect to it. It does not talk about retries, it does not talk about anything else, right? It's all about you are given an input, all you need to do is create an output. We will make sure that this is a guarantee the platform provides that the message will be for, uh, exactly once forwarded, retries are taken care of, and um, auto scaling is taken care of. We understand the streaming semantics well, back pressure and so forth. So from a user, all you need to do is give this handler this simple piece of code, and you can replace it with anything you can uh, think about. Now, this is the Kubernetes CR for the same pipeline. So the way it is, is it's nothing but a graph. You have a set of vertices, you have a source, inference, and a sync. And then you have an edge that connects between sources, your user-defined function, and your sync. So this makes a graph. Now let me show you a demo. This is a real one. Let me find that. Okay. So this is the cool UI we built. Uh, is, uh, is, this is a cluster summary. I'm just showing it from the local. Uh, what you're seeing is the namespaces we have and um, the pipelines that's running. So in this case, I already deployed the sentiment analytics model because it's a, it's, it's a large one. It takes a while to download. But it's very easy to create a pipeline. You click here, you, you can say, hey, input, that. And if I say submit, it will create a pipeline. Right? So it's easy. You can do all the CRUD operations from the UI itself, and we have our back using GitHub and things like that. Now, coming back to the sentiment analytics pipeline, if you look at the presentation, it's the same slide. right? You have input, inference. So it's very explainable by itself. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write some data to input, and I'm hoping that the output will come. Okay. Now, let's send a sentence. Basically, what I'm going to write is, writing documentation is like trying to explain quantum physics to a toddler. I send the data. I got it over. 4 And if you see, the output is here. Right? And it says clearly it's a negative sentiment. Right? It's like how difficult it is to write a document. Now let me send something that sounds better. Uh, Kubernetes is like the ultimate wingman, always there to support your app. I send it. It should be there. It's a positive sentiment. So th if you think and think about it, right, the example is very simple. But what if your input was a Slack webhook and you made a product release and you are just passing it through? In fact, this was a product manager use case. He did it during a hack day. So you can imagine how the simple it is, right? And uh, this code, by the way, is open source. You can take a look into it, and it's very simple to see. And I wasn't lying about the code. It's very small. Right. Um, so that is all about the demo. Let me get back to slides again. Now, I showed you a simple one. It does not mean NumaFlow cannot do complex things. It comes in different shapes and size. You could do multi-source, for example. You can do join operations on things. You could do join on UDFs and merging on UDFs. Since NumaFlow is more like a fire and forget because it can auto-scale, it knows node migration, port migration. So mostly at Intuit, we do it in a fire and forget mode. That meaning, how do you auto-reconfigure a pipeline at runtime? So we support something called side input, which can broadcast messages and reconfigure reconf itself. And lastly, it can even support cycles. So that uh, meaning, for example, you read some message and you thought, OK, let me reprocess the same message with additional context. So, and there are much more, but these are the key ones. Now let me talk about few use cases what we, the community and at Intuit we use using NumaFlow. Right? First is streaming analytics, that is number crunching. You have data that is coming in, you saw the in observability, we do golden signals, how do you comp compute availability, how do you detect errors and so forth, that's streaming analytics. The ML ops and ML inference is something the Numa project assist was doing earlier and also anomaly detection. And lastly, we, people also use for event-driven uh, application. You can relate this more like uh, 
streaming Argo workflows, where you get an event that could be metadata to other things and you do some processing. With this, I will hand it over to Amit to talk about a few success stories. Thank you, Vijit. So we wanted to walk you guys through some of the success stories so that you can get an idea where you can use NEMA flow. First is the streaming analytics. Uh, I mentioned golden signals when we talked about operational excellence. Uh, so golden signal pipelines at Intuit use NEMA flow. Some of the features which I wanted to highlight, it's multi-language. So it's written both Java and Go. And most important to me, it's like 30% efficient than equivalent Flink job, which we were running. The second is a community uh, example uh, where uh, Bcube is using it for digital signal processing. They use it, the same pipeline in on-prem, on on, in their cloud, as well as on the edge. So the footprint of NumaFlow is such small that you can run it on any edge device. We have successfully run it on, even on a Raspberry Pi. The second use cases is MLOps. We talked about NUMA processes. Some of the highlights there is you can use it for in-cluster analytics, AI ops. You can use it for LLM, both for training, creating the training data sets, doing A-B testing. And other use cases in MLOps is anomaly detection. That's most widely used in Intuit. Uh, any time series data, any developer can use it to generate anomaly. Again, it's a DIY, it's simple to use, so it's, you don't need to be a data engineer, ML engineer to do this. And the last set of use cases is event-driven. Uh, first is the metadata service. We get a lot of data from our cloud provider, and we want to process it as soon as possible. So the feature here is the scalability. We go from zero to hundreds of parts, uh, do it, uh, process it, and then again go back to zero. Again, for metadata service, it's almost 90% efficient, the cost efficient than the equivalent Lambda we used to run. And the last but not the least uh, success story is one of the largest uh, automotive company. It's using it for real-time map processing. So uh, you can think of it running on an edge. Uh, it scales up. It's always reliable uh, because you, your navigation depends on that. And I think one of the quotes they had, it's fire and forget, because they, fire, they run it for months without even touching, touching that. So again, the idea behind this is to give you guys an idea how you guys can use it. Uh, this is our QR code. You can go to GitHub. The demos you saw are available for you guys to download. Everything is open source. Uh, you will see other examples, other documentations blocked there. And also, if you like it, please go ahead and start, start the repo. That's how your community works. So thank you. Next talk, can you uh, elaborate more about the anom anomaly detection part? Sure. Uh, does that require uh, each application developer to define their own SLO, or you have a unified algorithm in platform level to do the, all the golden signal anomaly detection? Yeah. So, so if I read, got the question correct, first was how do you do anomaly detection, right? So our anomaly detection is based on we look at the application's run state and compare it with how it is performing now. So it's an auto encoder which we use. We have some around, uh, it's based on uh, 10 uh, inputs, uh, a sliding window of 10. But the key thing is that we look at the current pattern and compare with the historical pattern. And so it, it can understand um, time of the day, week or week and so forth. And um, it, but we avoid the cold start problem, meaning we start with just 180 inputs, meaning 180 minutes, that's around. Uh, less than three hours, up to three hours, and we are able to scale an anomaly score. So we do not have a cold start problem, and we go up to like last 10 days. So we compare that and give an anomaly score. The output is normalized. Anybody at Intuit will say what the value five mean, meaning five is a medium level anomaly. 10 meaning is completely anomalous, right? So that's how we standardize, standardized it. What was the second question I saw here? You had two questions, right? Uh, just with this one. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Really nice talk. Uh, I had a question around uh, 
real time incident analysis using AI and ML ops? Uh, do you guys really do that? Say, for example, you have a payment platform that you're connected to, and the, there's an issue with the payment platform. Uh, how do you detect that uh, in, inside of uh, your infrastructure? So how do you detect? So um, you remember Amit talking about failed customer interaction. For example, you have a W2 upload that is failing, and how do we come to know about it, right? So um, the way it happens is, um, let me show you a real. The beauty of this is that our UI is, um, if the, it loads, it should. Yeah, there you go. So what happens is this is the pipeline, right? So we get data from Kafka all the time. Let's say every interaction, there are hundreds of interactions, thousands of interactions happening, and we do inference. This is where we infer that data, saying that based on the current input, whether the current scenario is anomalous. And then we pre-process, post-process, this is where we normalize it. And we say that, okay, this is an anomaly, and we send it to all our things. For example, we send it to Kafka for further analytics, we send it for alerting, and also, we do, we do training on the fly because this is a zero configuration system, meaning if a new interaction comes up, we will understand that, okay, this is something new. We don't have a model for it. And we do a online training for that. So th this is how we use Numa approach. The key thing here, if you see, right, Numa flow is that you can do all this in a single pipeline. And this is a production pipeline that actually does the anomaly detection. And the output of this create incidents, now to tie it back. If it is a score greater than three, it's an incident fired at into it. And do you have automatic recovery? MTTR is a tricky bit. That's where uh, Amit was talking about is we have like uh, resilience, like multi-region deployments. We, we, for example, the change and everything we ro auto roll back, but uh, it, it's not a foolproof complete solution. And right? some of them you really have to debug, but we do give power to isolate. Meaning you can actually see what is going wrong to an extent and we do me mean time to isolate, but the way, some bits of MTTR is not automated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Issue. Are you using automatic recovery now? Are we using? So if we have an incident that comes up, does it automatically recover in your environment? For yes, for changes, yes. For changes, we use progressive delivery, and it automatically rolls back. So we use Numa Proj as well as Argo CD, Argo Rollouts. So both are open source project product. Argo CD and Argo Rollouts is used for deployment at Intuit. Uh, and we use progressive delivery. And the, the talk, as we discussed, based on the progressive delivery, if there is an anomaly, we roll it back. Just to, just to summarize, we do not use uh, LLM for uh, uh, mathematical use cases here. We use uh, autoencoders for anomaly detection, if you are curious. Thank you. You had a question? One, one quick one. What's the preferred kind of tenancy for NumaFlow? Or is it similar to what you would do with Argo workflows where you can run run per cluster? Or is it more of a kind of roll your own per namespace sort of situation? Yes, today it is uh, just within the cluster, but uh, there, it is n nothing is stopping us doing multi-cluster because all, one of the eight could be on another cluster. Okay. Nothing is stopping us as of today, but uh, at Intuit we do single cluster and single namespace. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.